in very kind of basic terms, a legal defense would be what somebody is saying in response to the state's allegations of them having broken a law. So if somebody is charged with destroying property, such as breaking a window, a legal defense could be not guilty, as in that person did not do that. Political defense, in contrast, would be about looking at the political climate and figuring out what are the different leverage points that can be used to bring the politics of the case or the politics of the movement that's being targeted into the forefront. So your political defense is really based off of what are your goals politically for your movement, whereas a legal defense is based off of what are your goals to have the least harm through the legal system as possible. Whether he's throwing down against racist cops or locking down against earth-destroying machines, if you get arrested, it's not just you that's on trial, it's your struggle too. A successful defense campaign draws on both legal and political tactics to mitigate the potential repercussions the case can have on individuals and the movement at large. Your legal defense is based off of the confines of the legal system. And the goal of defense is to get you off of charges, to make sure that you're acquitted at trial, or you negotiate a plea that's favorable to you and avoid going to trial if that might be the best thing in your particular legal situation. Whereas a political defense can sometimes actually butt up against that normal legal defense. There's different costs that can be involved, but there's also a lot that can be gained through taking a political approach. This approach moves away from the realm of what is deemed legal by lawmakers and steps into the larger realm of ethics, morality, and liberation from all forms of oppression. It can also include defendants deciding that they're not going to cooperate with the proceedings against them. Notably, different Puerto Rican independence fighters and some Black Liberation Army soldiers back in the 70s and 80s decided that they were taking a prisoner of war approach to their cases. So they rejected the legitimacy of the US government to file and press charges against them and refused to cooperate in the proceedings at all. Those prisoners of war were convicted despite their lack of participation and many of them sentenced to decades in prison, a good number of who are still serving those time. It can also mean trying to put pressure onto the legal system itself, calling campaigns, reaching out to the prosecutor's office or the judge, writing letters to the judge from people all over the country or all over the world about this particular defendant or group of co-defendants. Over the last number of years, there have been a number of successful uses of political defense. Most of those are unfortunately also like mixed victories where we're able to win in certain respects and lose in other respects. An example that comes to mind is the C.C. McDonald case in Minnesota. C.C. is a black trans woman who was attacked while walking to the grocery store late one night. And in the fight that ensued, one of the attackers was stabbed uh, near the heart and died on the scene. He was later found to have had a swastika tattoo on his chest, which he received while involved in white supremacist gangs in prison. C.C. was the only one who was charged in that incident at first, and she was initially facing 20 years on a murder charge. After a certain amount of time in her case, she was offered a plea agreement to around 10 years and she rejected that. So the prosecutors added on a higher level murder charge that upped the time that she was facing to 40 years. I was involved in her defense committee and we were able to get a lot of support and solidarity for her from across the country and across the world and helped expose that prosecution for being a continuation of the racist transphobic attack against CC that the white supremacists in the streets had begun by attacking CC and her friends. As a result of that pressure campaign in combination with her defense that her legal team was working on, she was able to accept a plea agreement to a lower level felony charge of involuntary manslaughter. She had to serve about an additional year of prison time and she's been released for a number of years now and has been involved in a lot of public organizing, public speaking in pursuit of justice for trans people, particularly black trans women, because of the large numbers of trans folks and black trans women in particular who are assaulted and targeted and murdered in the streets. The legal system is meant to really individualize people and to isolate you from one another, and it's good at doing it. And so the more that we can maintain communication with one another, the more that we can maintain our solidarity with one another. There are plenty of people who are charged criminally that'll fold on somebody else in order to save their own self. But if that's something that is absolutely against your values and your politics, you need to find an attorney who also is gonna uphold those same values and politics and not push you to do something just because it might be better for your individual case. So if you have co-defendants, you wanna make sure that your plea agreement or any statement of facts that you have to sign aren't going to harm or incriminate other people if they're you know, known co-defendants, especially if they're not known co-defendants. You know? 
know if the state doesn't know something, we want to keep it that way. It is important that we understand the implications and consequences of snitching and do our best to ensure that all defendants feel supported and do not buckle under the state's pressure and coercion to comply with their demands. Non-cooperation agreements are meant to establish trust and solidarity between co-defendants and make it clear that defendants will refuse to help the state in its efforts to prosecute us. In the case of A20, over half of the defendants have agreed to points of unity which include a non-cooperation agreement, refusing to snitch on each other or otherwise cooperate with the state in targeting and isolating their co-defendants. This agreement also includes a commitment to sharing resources and working together for our collective defense. There are people facing charges from all over the country and people that maybe didn't know each other before and communities that weren't necessarily very well connected to one another are better connected now. And so while the state thinks that they can use things like this to tear us apart, it's actually an opportunity for us to grow stronger if we are willing to be bold.